Hi, everyone. It's just great to welcome you to Transformative Learning in the Humanities. I'm Kathy. I'm Shelly. And hi. really, hi. And really, today, all we're going to do is just talk a little bit about the things that make us tick, the things that we think are going to be really exciting this semester um, of thinking and working together, and kind of the things we're going to be doing at the Institute on June 23rd. Yep. And I think I'm going to start off, Kathy, by asking what makes you tick? What beyond work are you passionate about? Okay, I would say there's two things. One, um, I moved to New York in 2014. And before that, I lived in North Carolina, and I was a passionate gardener. Every five years, I would tear out my garden and redesign it. And I came to New York and I didn't miss it at first. And then more and more, I just needed plants. So I've started raising orchids. And in the pandemic, it's become more than a passion. It's a little nuts. Um, there are many, many orchids, some half dead, some alive, some blooming, some not uh, around my apartment. So I do that. And then the other thing is I've started writing science fiction for fun and reading it. And I'm loving that. I think maybe the world isn't so great and I'm enjoying uh, imagining the future. Um, so that those are the two things that I spend most of my time on when I'm not doing work work. Uh, what about you? Yoga. Wow. <laughs> wow. Been, yeah, you know, I've always been into yoga, but lately it's been especially uh, restorative and stabilizing. And I think maybe too, all this sitting in one place has got me really wanting to stretch and move. And of course, all of the drama and tension and hardship in the world has got me really wanting to peep out and find a way to be at ease in all of this. Um, and so I'm actually learning to be a yoga instructor. Will you do that at TLH? Will you maybe have us do some stretches? If, yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> <laughs> so what are you reading right now? What are you listening to? What are you watching? Oh, so I'm reading this astonishing book. It's called The World of Octavia E. Butler, A Handful of Earth, A Handful of Sky by Linnell George. And it's both sad and wonderful. It has things like, you know, the greatest writer of the 20th century, in my opinion, mm -hmm. um, how she had to sell her typewriter for enough money to write another day. It's her diaries, it's her notes. It's um, a note she makes towards novels that she then writes. It's such an intimate, a uh, personal book. I, I read it almost like um, almost like a religious text. It's it's so wonderful. And music. And, you know, this sort of goes along with you doing yoga. I've been listening a lot to this um, new album called Promises by Pharaoh Sanders and somebody whose pseudonym is um, um, Floating Points. Yeah. Uh, it's very meditative. Uh, Pharaoh Sanders, I think, is in his 80s. He used to play saxophone with Coltrane and the greats. And this young man and this old man and this blending of this very spiritual music, it's kind of what I need right now. So, so those are the things. Watching is goofy. Watching, I watch anything that's about starting bad and becoming good. So I'm watching home repair shows, cooking shows, and I don't cook. So I'm watching <laughs> High on the Hog. Is that what it's called now? Oh, it's a, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's so good about African-American yeah. cuisine and modern cuisine. Um, but I kind of am passionate about stuff where there's, I know there's going to be a happy ending at the end and maybe even a reveal. <laughs> what about you? What are you listening and watching? And well, first I want to say that um, you recommended that Pharaoh Sanders album and I listened to it a couple of days ago and I was like, wow, this is some far out music, which is hilarious <laughs> because I find myself listening to far out music. And right now I'm really into Zamrock, which is 1970s psychedelic music from Zambia. Wow. <laughs> wow. We need to put links in our in our TLH chat or something. <laughs> That's a good idea. That's a good idea. And there's this band called Witch that I am loving. And who knew there was this like this whole psychedelic, Afro-psychedelic movement in Zambia in the wow. 1970s. And I keep thinking wow. about that to kind of get, even catch up to your um futurism. In, in writing science fiction and reading Octavia Butler, because um, I'm really interested in like the future and, and maybe my attraction to the Zamrock moment is this moment of, of, of hopefulness that was happening in, in the black worlds all over, you know, from the Caribbean to so many countries in Africa. I We're love that. I, 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 there's so many things to be critical about. There's so much horror going on. 
It's also an amazing time for world art and literature, especially by uh, African Black diaspora citizens, by people of color all over the world. It's just an amazing time. I mean, it, 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 that's the other side of it. Yeah. Af Futurism is here on the level of art, yeah. music, all that, yeah. It's true. And I also watch TikTok a lot, but I'm not allowed to say that <laughs> around intellectuals. Well, I know you watch a lot of TikTok. It's hilarious <laughs> to me. My my basic my basic TV watching kind of goes in that realm too. I just watch the escapist TV and I've been traveling um by watching TV. I've been watching cooking shows and travel shows and 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 more cooking shows. Um and I did start watching High on the Hog. And then I saw this other one, this British uh, TV um, series. I forget what it's called. It's on BBC. And um, I just watched one about Ethiopia and art and power. Oh, I'd love the link to that one too. That's oh, great. Yeah. That's That's great. great. <laughs> so how do these things inspire your work, Kathy? So it's interesting. I think writing science fiction makes me so appreciative of anyone who creates. Um, I recently heard a show with a great theorist, um, Catherine McKittrick, who wrote this incredible book called Dear Science. And our colleague Ruth, uh, Ruthie Gilmore was on the show and she said, I, she loves working with artists and with athletes because they know you have to work and work and work and work and throw things out and practice and plan to make something happen. And that's how social changes. You can't just critique, you have to go from there and do something. So I think that the uh, work even with my pathetic tired orchids and trying to get orchids to bloom in New York where my light is bad and, and in my one bedroom overheated apartment, nothing quite grows white, right. I think that and writing science fiction and being a very poor amateur writer informs my sense of seriousness and respect that's about um, what I bring to the humanities and the arts and also what I bring to my own academic work. What about, what about you, what is yoga? Uh, do in terms of your own work and scholarship? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm tripping on your answer because I was thinking about this, you know, as we were talking about making this this video for TLH fellows and I was thinking about um, what inspires me and, and, and I want to build things too. It's so funny that we didn't really talk about this completely. <laughs> oh, no, not rehearsed, <laughs> non-rehearsed. <laughs> <laughs> I want to build things. And I realized that the things that I have to build, the materials I have are, are ideas. And, and this is where Twyla Tharp, the, the, the dancer and choreographer comes to mind because she says the same thing in, um, in her book, The Creative Habit. She says that creativity is a discipline, it's a practice. And maybe that's what yoga is doing for me. It's helping me find some discipline when I can't, when, when I have so much trouble focusing on some of the other things that I more traditionally can discipline and focus on. Um, but I still wanna build things. And I feel like right now, like out of the ruins of, of this pandemic and the hardships and the loss, um, I find myself like really looking to, to make something. So. Uh, that's what that's what inspires me right now, and this is what excites me about um, the future, the near future, and hopefully the longer term future. Um, it's, I'm thinking a lot about my assumptions. I'm thinking a lot about um, my perspective on things, and I'm I'm really hoping to change. I'm hoping to grow and change. And um, you know, when we were talking about book choices and ideas and gifts that we could send to the fellows. I remember a conversation you and I had about mindset and I wasn't really thinking about like growth mindsets. I was thinking about, about, about habits of mind, I was thinking. And, and then you recommended that Mao book. And I was like, whoa, whoa, can you say some more about why you and how you came up with that suggestion? Sure. I, I'm sure, I hope everyone's gotten it by now. You can see it's got my little post-it notes in it. Um, I love it for several reasons. One, it doesn't look like a textbook. I mean, you open up any page and it's crazy. The colors are crazy. The, uh, the typeface is sometimes white on black, sometimes black on white, sometimes multicolored. Um, but he has this idea that if you're going to change your life and your work, you have to do it within constraints. You have to think of, and this is what every builder does this is what you do in yoga that it's your body is your constraint as well as certain formal rules of yoga me raising my pathetic orchids in this apartment or trying to be a science fiction writer when i'm an amateur 
And that's what all of our students are too. Our students start as amateurs. And to me, the best thing we can do is not teach them stuff, but give them the tools so they can always be curious and always be inspired and always see even in the most discouraging political, social, economic times that there's ways that they can make themselves better. And I don't mean pull yourself up by the bootstraps. I mean, thinking critically about the world and thinking about how I can shape myself in the world. As Mao says, 24 principles for designing massive change in your life and your work. And I love that, that a change in your life and your work can be a massive change, not only in your life and your work, but in the world. And I love it that he both gives you rules and then breaks the rules. And I think for our group of 51 fellows, I believe we're going to be warriors. I believe that CUNY, more than any other institution in the country, is the place to model a new form of teaching, where teaching and social activism and thinking about a better society and creativity and building are continuous. But that requires us to think of ourselves differently as teachers. It doesn't just require students to think of themselves differently. Things about us to think of the classroom. Bell Hook says the classroom is the most radical space of possibility in the academy. I, I believe that, and I, but, but most of us are afraid to take that risk. And Mao is very good at pushing us to take risks, including at failing and saying, okay, so what did we just learn from that one? That was a flop. So what did we learn from it? So that, yeah. that's my thing. What about you? What about the books that you like most for it that we're going to be sharing with uh, other fellows? I'm getting, I'm getting like tingly all over just thinking about it actually. One, because that's what, you know, like this Twyla Tharp book that's like all in my head, she says as, as a dancer and a choreographer, she says that um, to think outside of the box, we begin with the box. <laughs> um, which is cool, which is kind of like what you're saying about Mao. And it's, it's so funny that this kind of changing habits of mind or approaching habits of mind and actually thinking about the discipline of building and creativity is, is so similar and different at the same time. And I'm excited about the Lost and Found books too. And I'm excited about them particularly because it's CUNY professors and Ooh, trailblazers. <laughs> <laughs> what were you gonna say? I was gonna say I matched the books today. I didn't plan that. See that? <laughs> See that I because you're working yeah. against a, a back a lost and found background. Mm -hmm. And not only that, I matched the books because I've been worshiping on the you know the altars of Audre Lorde, June Jordan, Tony Kane Babara, and Adrian Richardson's forever. And to find myself making my career at CUNY, where they launched their academic careers, where they set the tone for, I should say blaze the trail that we are going to pick up and follow is pretty cool. And that CUNY's initiative, the Lost and Found Initiative, actually are the people who got together and made those beautiful books that you have is beshared. It's meant to be. And I can't wait for us to build from that blueprint. Yeah, you and I have talked about this before, but when CUNY went open admissions in the 1970s and started the SEEK program, there were a lot of CUNY faculty members that were very, very critical and thought this would ruin CUNY. And then these four really famous writers loved it. So Andre and Rich actually left Columbia to come to be part of the SEEK program. Interestingly, I don't know who those people, those dissenters are, but these uh, no. writers are household names now and they still inspire us. That's that's so great. It's just Nobody, yep. Mm -mm. Nobody remembers those people, those haters who are hating. It's pretty, it's pretty true. And what's also really cool is we know, I know, we have colleagues who are also continuing the scholarly tradition of excavating that work, not just in the Lost and Found series, but I know that, that at least one or two of the fellows in this cohort of 51 are doing scholarship that's continuing that legacy. So we are really in... Um, in good company. And we have a chance to really be pedagogical leaders, not just at CUNY, but nationally and paving the way for the ways of public education. Absolutely. I also love the way these four writers were prolific, serious writers and prolific, serious teachers and didn't see those and institution builders. And they didn't see those as one was somehow right and, and respectable and one was not. I mean, they were passionate about it all. And the, these lost and found books really show the connections between those things. And I really hope that's part of the method and the message that we all share in the TLH initiative. 
I can't wait to see what everyone has to say about that and the other books. So what do you think about the other two books that we, we sent everyone? So these are, these are also books that I hope nobody expected. Um, one is the Anti-Racist Writing Watch Workshop, which unlike all this garbage we're hearing now against critical race theory, which gets it completely wrong, this is the most generous book I've read. It really is about how you turn critique into a creative process. How you ask students, where are you on your journey? How far have you gotten? How much further do you think you have to go? How are you gonna get there? How did what you do in this class help you on your journey? And it's, it's such a passionate, real way of saying, let's not start with a bunch of rubrics and categories that don't apply. Let's let, make, let students design categories for their own success and see how we can help them in that way. I, it's a beautiful book. Um, I don't know Felicia Rose Chavez, but I hope maybe we can invite her to talk That'd sometime. Be cute. Wouldn't That'd that be, be cool? That She's would be great. cute. And then I happen to be with a, a new PhD, Christina Katapotis, who's the executive director of TLH. I happen to be in this book, Ungrading, uh, with a chapter on contract grading. About 20 years ago, I started doing research on grading and realizing what a goofy, accidental, silly system it is. It was invented in 1897 at Mount Holyoke University to make the modern woman scientific. The next organization that picked it up was the American Meat Packers Association. Um, you know, it's a very odd, odd system that we all have believed in. And none of, you know, you say, oh, what are you doing this week? I'm grading. No one goes, yay, I'm grading, right? We all go, ah, awful grading. And we all know it's imperfect. Also, we've done studies, there've been studies of grading and the single most common grade given in America and high, in higher education today is the A. That's weird. We, raise, we waste so much of our time and energy and we make students so anxious over a grade and the most common grade we give is an A and the wealthier the institution, the higher the tuition, the more likely the grade is to be an A. And that, that doesn't necessarily mean the best, most selective institutions, it just means the wealthiest ones. If students are paying enough money, you don't dare give them less than an A. Well, come on, that's not a good system. So this book is not just, it's called Ungrading, Why Rating Students Undermines, Lear Undermines Learning. We have 40 years of studies on this and what to do instead. So it's again, not just critique, but a really helpful book that gives you lots of different ways of uh, working around grading. I mean, needless to say, no one's gonna get fired for taking, ever being part of TLH. We still have to give grades at the end of the term. Our institution requires it, but how can we do things on the way to a final grade that help our students be motivated and understanding that a grade is just a thing at the end of the class. Of course they need it. Of course it's important for professional school, all that. But what's really important is how much they're learning and how good they're becoming, how much better they are than when they, be, when they started. And this book gives a lot of very practical things. It's become a movement to our shock. People who we don't know at all have taken it up and they're doing workshops. They're doing Twitter workshops. There's, I think, 800 people now who are part of this ungrading resistance force, they call themselves. I don't know these folks, but other people around the world are joining this. So that's going to be exciting, too, to explore some of these possibilities. I'm into it. I'm into taking down the institution brick by brick <laughs> and rebuilding something else. Something that actually empowers the people that we teach and empowers us and makes it so that we can build careers and feel fulfilled and excited about the work that we do, the noble work that we do. So um, I'm excited about this moment of collaboration we're all gonna have together and the high impact um, pedagogical leadership that we all are going to have together. And um, for everybody, thank you for checking us out and for uh, getting to the end of this video. Um, there is an email that we're sending that comes with this video. There's going to be um, um, some suggestions for light reading before our meeting on June 23rd at 10 a.m. There's also a registration link for the Zoom meeting on June 23rd at 10 a.m. And um, we're asking that you complete it as soon as you can. And we're also super duper excited um, to get together. Um, we'll do it virtually and hopefully we'll find some ways to um, meet in person um, this fall. Very excited. It's going to be just great. I'm 51 people from every single campus at CUNY. Incredible. Incredible. 
Bye, <laughs> everyone. See you on the 23rd. I can't wait. Yeah, me too. Peace Thanks, out. everybody. <laughs> Bye-bye.